Hi everyone, my name is FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 using only Dark-type Pokemon. If you're experiencing Deja Vu, it's because I already did a whole video on this challenge, but that video ended in classic FlygonHG fashion, with a wipe to the champion. It was the third challenge in a row where I wiped to the champion, so I was feeling pretty deflated. But after taking a bit of a break to do a Platinum Randomizer, which I won, I felt ready to take on this challenge again. And boy was it a journey. If you haven't seen the first video, check that out, because I'll be skimming over some stuff in this video that I went into more detail on in that video. And I'd hate for you to be in the dark about anything. But let's quickly recap the setup for this challenge. I have a fairly in-depth list of what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules in the description of this video. But in short, in addition to your regular Nuzlocke rules, there's no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. There are 11 Dark-type encounters in Pokemon Black 2. Liopard, Umbreon, Scrafty, Crocodile, Mandibuzz, Zorark, Drapion, Absol, Bisharp, Weavile, and... however you say this. Zuelas. And as a final note, I play with Species Claws, meaning that I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Okay, so without further ado, Pokemon Black 2 with Dark Types Only, Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, starts right now. Attempt 3 was the attempt that I wiped to Iris, so we're starting this video with Attempt 4. If you remember from the previous video, the beginning of this challenge is one of the most difficult parts, because I have to beat the first two gym leaders with just a purloin. Although, I guess it's not so much difficult as it is just highly dependent on luck, since to beat Charon, I have to hope that Fury Swipes connects and consistently gets decent rolls. After I catch Thanos, who is now female, I challenge Charon. He leads Patrat, and I hit a Fury Sweat. Okay, fine, I miss, and Patrat gets a work up off. But on the next turn... On the third turn, Thanos connects with a Fury Swipes, which only hits two times. This is not instilling me with confidence. But on the next turn, Thanos does manage to get a three hit Fury Swipes, as Patrat just keeps using work up for some reason. So, as long as we connect with another Fury Swipes, we'll be able to take out this Patrat without losing any health. Well, the Patrat goes down on the next turn, and then Lillipup comes out. And not that it really matters, but Thanos does manage to miss yet another Fury Swipes before getting knocked out. Good riddance. On attempt 5, I catch a Purloin with a Gentle Nature, which lowers my defense. I decide it's not really worth it to even try to take Charon on, so I just reset right there. Same goes for attempt 6, but on attempt 7, I try the fight against Charon. But this version of Thanos also can't hit water falling out of a boat, so we wipe to Charon's Patrat. Not even his Lillipup, his Patrat. I'm starting to wonder whether attempt 3 was actually just some sort of fluke and this is never gonna happen. But on attempt 8, the Mad Titan returns to his full form. It's clear that this Thanos is the spiritual successor of Attempt 3 Thanos, who single-handedly crit his way through half of Marshall's team, and half of mine. We start the battle against Charon by landing a 5-hit Fury Swipes, knocking out Patrat in one shot. Or, I, I guess, five shots. Then Lillipup comes out. I start to think that Thanos 8.0 might be some sort of false idol when he only hits a 2-hit Fury Swipes on the next turn, but then he gets a 4-hit Fury Swipes. Charon heals, but Thanos 8.0 gets another 4-hit Fury Swipes, putting the Lillipup back in red. With Charon's potion used up, Thanos is free to finish off the good boy with a scratch. Five attempts later, and we finally get badge number one. Thanos 8.0 is a monster, so needless to say, Roxy doesn't stand a chance either. She leads coughing, but Thanos 8.0 mercilessly rips that whoopee cushion in half with a critical hit return. Warlipede comes out next, but Thanos 8.0 squashes her like the bug she is. Two returns are enough to knock it out, and with that, Thanos 8.0 has claimed his second gym badge without even breaking a sweat. With the early game finally behind us, it's starting to look like attempt 8 might actually go all the way. The chance of wiping significantly decreases after the first two gyms. Thanos evolves into Liopard, and I catch an Eevee, who happens to be female yet again. So I name her Bellatrix. And after evolving into Umbreon, Bellatrix again sweeps through Berg's team after setting up with Workup. It goes just as well as in attempt 3, and we get an easy badge number 3. From here, I have the option to get the static Weak Armor Mandibuzz from Route 4, but because Weak Armor is trash and I'm not particularly good at playing around it, I decide to skip it. I'll catch a Velebi on Route 23 right before Victory Road instead. She'll at least help me with Marshall. 
This also means that I can use Route 4 to get another chance of a Moxie Sandile, in case the one I encounter in Relic Castle has Intimidate instead. Both abilities are pretty great, but I'd prefer Moxie, so it's nice to have a backup on Route 4. But the Sandile I encounter in Relic Castle ends up having Moxie, so I catch him, and again name him K. Rule. After that, I catch a Scraggy in the Desert Resort, and somehow she also again has Moxie. And because she's again female, I name her... Berla! Yes, I did the same joke twice. But because I'm acknowledging it, it's not lazy, it's meta. So it's okay. That's how comedy works. The next bit of the game is basically the exact same as in Attempt 3, only that I don't accidentally kill my Mandibuzz since I don't even have it yet. Elisa is pretty easy with K. Rule after he evolves into Crocorock. Amulja, Amulja, Amulja. I get Loki the Zerua from Driftvale City, and now that I know how Bulldoze interacts with Dig, Clay is much easier as well. We can just skip all of this and jump straight to the battle against Skyla. Which, uh... Well, well, it could have gone better. Now, I remember Skyla being pretty easy to sweep through with Bellatrix last time, so I just plan to do the same thing here, and I don't really put much thought into it. I start by instantly taking out the Swoobout with a Dark Gem Boosted Crunch from K. Rule. Then, the Deformed Duck comes out. Wait a minute. That's not K. Rule. That, that's Loki, you son of a gun. I've been tricked by the trickster god himself. Now, of course, this bit is completely scripted and completely intentional. I definitely didn't have to re-record this audio and add it in after I noticed my mistake in the original recording while editing the footage. You'd have to be a dummy to be tricked by imposter. And I am certainly not a dummy. Anyways, I switched to Bellatrix. The plan is to just set up with Workup and stay healthy with Moonlight and Leftovers. The only problem is that Swana knows Feather Dance, which I didn't consider because it never used it in Attempt 3. Swana also outspeeds Bellatrix this time since she doesn't have as many speed EVs invested as in Attempt 3. This is really not great, because it means that Swana has a small chance to flinch with Air Slash. And by a small chance, I obviously mean that it happens a lot. So it becomes a lot harder to set up, especially with Swana still throwing those Feather Dances around to lower my attack. I really should have taught Bellatrix Snarl. That would have made this so much easier. I try to stall Swana out of Air Slashes by using Moonlight, as I also set up workups. And it works for a while, until Swana gets a poorly timed flinch, and then an even more poorly timed critical hit, which knocks out Bellatrix. Rest well, you beautiful doggo. It's pretty bad to lose Bellatrix since she's my bulkiest Pokemon by far, but we gotta do our best to carry on. It's what she would have wanted. The rest of this battle goes smoothly enough, but I do have to risk a bunch of crits and a few inaccurate attacks. After Thanos ultimately does nothing to Molly Weasley thanks to her using Roost, Loki is able to take it out with two Snarls, which thankfully connect. Skarmory comes out last, so I switch to Darla. Skarmory's only flying type move is Air Cutter, which is special. Since Skarmory has atrocious special attack, Darla is able to finish her off with a few Brick Breaks, getting us a very sloppy victory. After saying goodbye to our fallen pupper, I catch a Skruppy, who is again male, so I name it Venom, and he joins the team. Somehow this Venom also has battle armor, so I'm getting really lucky with these abilities. Even though losing Bellatrix still sucks, Drapion is also pretty bulky, so as long as I don't lose him to a Pelipper again, things will be fine. After evolving Venom and making it through Twist Mountain unscathed, I go to catch an Absol, but Venom takes out the one on Route 13 with a Night Slash crit. Nice. So I go to Route 14 to catch another one. I decide not to damage this one at all and just throw balls at it. But after failing to catch it with a bunch of Dusk Balls, Absol manages to set up a few sword stances. So instead of risking it killing me, I decide to just use my Master Ball. I really can't afford to lose Venom, so this is definitely the safest play. Since Absol is a female this time, I name her Cruella. And without Bellatrix, our team has a slot open for one good pupper, so she joins the team. And for the first time in the run, we finally have a full team. And it's looking really strong. What could possibly go wrong? Ah, sh**. Okay, so I accidentally run into this black belt immediately after catching Cruella. As you might recall, fighting types are pretty difficult for us to deal with, and Venom is at half health for dealing with Cruella. Fortunately, all this guy has is Girder, and Venom knows Aerial Ace. F Dynamic Punch has 50% accuracy, by the way. Well, without Battle Armor Drapion, there are a ton of battles coming up that are so much harder, including Drayden. But at least we still have K. Rule, who should be able to set up some pretty nasty Moxie sweeps. Mother f This is probably one of the dumbest deaths that I've ever had. 
Basically what happened is that I was walking through some dark grass on the top of Route 12 so as to avoid the fighting type trainers in the middle of the map. I was leading Darla in preparation for an upcoming trainer. Because I'm stupid, I wasn't repelling. So I encountered a Tranquil and a Roselia. And Darla is pretty slow. She's actually brave nature, which will be important later on, but for now, it means that when we try to run from this wild battle, I can't actually escape, so this freaking level 41 Roselia one-shots K. Rule with a pedal dance. I don't, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. That was a really long series of unfortunate events, but I don't really have anyone to blame but myself. It was just sloppy. Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. Oh, and by the way, the deaths of Venom and K. Rule happened no more than 30 minutes apart from each other. So it was a pretty bad day of streaming. Now, you might think that it would make sense to just give up here and reset. My team is in shambles, and without Drapion and Crocodile, my chances of beating Drayden, much less the rest of the game, are starting to seem pretty slim. But for better or for worse, I'm stubborn, and I'm not about to go back to the purloin-induced purgatory that is the early game of this challenge. So I keep going, hoping that the bench warmers from Attempt 3 will rise to the occasion and carry me through Attempt 8. After that fiasco, I go to catch Pawniard from Route 9. She's female now, so I name her Male Fission. She's not any help right now, but unless I somehow find a way to kill her, she's a guaranteed win against Getsus. But first is Drayden, and this is pretty challenging. I'm able to take out his gym trainers with ice punches from Darla, but because Darla is so slow, I can't outspeed Drayden's Drodagon. His Flygon and Haxorus will also outspeed me, so even if I can one-shot them, the combined damage from all three is way too much for Darla to handle. I have to rely on Cruella instead. After a single Swords Dance, Cruella can one-shot all of Drayden's Pokémon with Black Glass's boosted Night Slashes. But in order to get a Swords Dance off, I need to dodge a Critical Hit Revenge from Drudagon. If he gets the crit, I'm definitely gonna wipe. So the battle begins, and Drayden sends out his Drudagon. Cruella comes out and sets up a Swords Dance. And then Drudagon uses Revenge... And it doesn't crit. The run lives. Three Night Slashes take out Drayden's Pokemon, and that gets us badge number seven. Good job, Cruella. From here, it's a pretty quick turnaround before it's time to take on Marlin. I managed to not lose a Pokemon in his gym this time, but he still poses a bit of a problem. Darla is too slow this time around to be able to outspeed the Caracosta or the Wailord, so I'd be risking way too many chances to get burned. Plus, she's less bulky than before too, so Scald does more damage. Instead, it's time for Thanos 8.0 to earn his spot on the team. For some reason, Lyopard can learn Seed Bomb from the Move Tutor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up Thanos 8.0 for a Seed Bomb sweep. Marlin leads Caracosta. I start with a Fake Out to break the Caracosta's Sturdy as it flinches. Then I set up a Hone Clause as the Caracosta goes for a Shell Smash. But because Thanos is so speedy, and because Caracosta is literally a turtle, Thanos is still able to outspeed it and kill it on the next turn. Waylord comes out next, but thanks to the Hone Claw's attack boost, Seed Bomb knocks it out in one shot. It is a critical hit because Thanos 8.0 is unstoppable, but it doesn't actually matter. I am inevitable. Lastly, the Jellicent goes down to a Night Slash, and with that, Thanos has soloed his third gem, and we get our eighth and final gym badge. From here, we've got to do a bunch of Team Plasma stuff. First though, I catch a Sneasel from the Giant Chasm. He's male this time around, so I name him Slade and he joins the team. For only the second time in this run, we have a full team of six. Surely I won't screw this up, right? Now normally I would skip all the Team Plasma stuff and just jump to the fight against Getsis, but without K. Rule, some of these fights are actually pretty difficult. The Chorus fight in particular is incredibly difficult. He has a Magneton and a Magnezone that can fire off very powerful electric type attacks, and both of them have Sturdy. His Magnezone also knows Explosion, Basically, none of my Pokémon can survive more than a few of those attacks, especially if they crit. My best play is to use Darla and just kinda hope that they don't crit. But since Darla is so freaking slow, I outspeed very few of Colrus's Pokémon, so I'll be taking a lot of damage before knocking things out. Fortunately, Drain Punch does help a little bit. Colrus leads Magneton, who instantly goes for a Volt Switch. This brings out Magnezone, who gets hit by a Drain Punch. Colrus uses a Full Restore, but I just bring it back into the red with another Drain Punch. Then Magnezone pieces out with an explosion, which does a huge chunk. But more importantly, it means I don't get a Moxie boost. Kling Clang comes out next. A Jija Impact crit will likely kill, but I can't afford to switch because Kling Clang might also just go for a Shift Gears. So I stay in. It does indeed go for a Shift Gear as Drain Punch brings it into the red. 
Then it goes for a Jija Impact, which thankfully doesn't crit, but it looks like I might have survived even if it had. Kling Clang goes down, and then the Matang comes out. I actually outspeed this one, so a single Fire Punch finishes it off. Behem comes out next, but it's also a Lard Cake, so I knock it out with a Crunch before it can get any damage off. Last is Magneton. It hits a really nasty Flash Cannon as I recover most of my health back with Drain Punch. After another hit from Flash Cannon, a final Drain Punch finishes it off, winning us the battle. Things ended up working out pretty well, but a handful of crits, or even a paralysis if Magnezone had decided to go for Discharge, could have made that much, much worse. I got lucky. The next big fight is Kirin Black and Getsis, but Malefishin is yet again able to make relatively quick work of both of them. Unfortunately, Malefishin's speed IV is quite a bit lower than Shredder's speed IV was in Attempt 3, so she's not actually guaranteed to outspeed Kirin Black, depending on its IVs in nature, which are random. So if the Kirim gets a Paralysis with Dragon Breath, or it crits with Fusion Bolt, this could be pretty bad. Fortunately, the Kirim just hits a non-critical hit Fusion Bolt, so Male Fission is able to finish it off with a Steel Gem Boosted Iron Head. We crit, which does feel good, even if it wasn't actually necessary. After that, it's a classic Swords Dance sweep of Getsus' team. In Attempt 3, I actually needed to set up a couple Swords Dances, but this time, Male Fission's attack stat is a bit higher, so I just need to do one. Every single one of Getsus' Pokémon goes down in one shot. Hydreigon is actually able to outspeed Malefishin on this attempt, because Malefishin's speed IV is like 4. But fortunately, Getsus' Hydreigon is physical for some reason, and it has nothing to hit Malefishin for super effective damage with, so after a weak Dragon Rush, it goes down. I guess Dragon Rush could have flinched, but it would have had to flinch like 3 times for that to matter. That's Getsus defeated. From here, I finally get access to Route 23 which means that I can finally get a Mandibuzz without weak armor, which will finally give me something to handle fighting types with. But then I get an idea for quite possibly the coolest strategy that I've ever come up with, and in order to pull it off, I actually need weak armor Mandibuzz. So I go back to Route 4 and catch Yzma. I'll explain why she's so useful in a second. Next up, we need to clear through Victory Road. Remember how in the previous video I said that Victory Road wasn't too much of an issue because of Moxie Crocodile? Yeah, well, without K. Rule, some of these trainers become a lot harder. Chief among them is veteran Portia, who has a sock with Sturdy. It takes a while to come up with a plan that doesn't put me at risk to a bunch of critical hits, but eventually I find one that isn't too bad. She leads with a Zebstrika, so I lead with Loki the Zoroark, disguised as male fishing. A Dark Gem boosted Dark Pulse knocks out the Zebstrika in one shot. Then Sock comes out, so I switch to Yzma, who tanks a Brick Break, and breaks Sock's Sturdy thanks to a Rocky Helmet. Then I set up an Iron Defense, as Sock uses Bulk Up. Then, Yzma hits an Air Slash, which crits, and knocks out the Sock. Nice. Last is Starmie, so I switch to Slade, who tanks a Surf. Then, he hits the Starmie with a Night Slash. But I did forget to give him a Dark Gem, so the Starmie hangs on with a Sliver, and knocks out Slade with a Flash Cannon. Yet again, I'm gonna have to go into the fight with Iris without my Speedy Ice type. Rest in peace, Slade. The rest of Victory Road turns out okay. I did have to dodge a crit against my rival's Bufalant, which was really scary, but despite all odds, I'm able to make it to the Elite Four with a full team of six. Here they are, leveled up to level 58. If I wipe here, there's no chance I'm doing this entire challenge again for a third time. So, let's see if this team has what it takes. Just like last time, I start with Chantel. And after setting up a single Swords Dance, I sweep through her entire team with Male Fission. This time, I also equip an XP share to Darla because I'm going to need her to gain a few levels from the Elite Four fights to be able to even stand a chance against Iris. This feels a little disingenuous, but it's not against my personal rule set, since I define the level cap as ending at the start of the Elite Four. Plus, Darla still won't be a higher level than Iris' Haxorus, so whatever. Anyways, that's Chantel defeated. Caitlyn is second, and also a freebie. I lead Cruella, and she sets up a Swords Dance as her Musharna uses Yawn. On the next turn, I kill it with a Night Slash. Poor Cruella gets a little sleepy from killing the Lucky Charms Marshmallow, but a Chesto Berry wakes her up. So a few more Night Slashes take out the rest of Caitlyn's team. Who needs K. Rule when we have this cute little Harbinger of Doom? Third is Grimsley, who still hasn't figured out his glaring weakness to fighting type moves. Loser. Darla kills all of his Pokemon with Moxie boosted Drain Punches, and that's three members of the Elite Four defeated. All that's left is Marshall. Last time Marshall wiped half of my team, although admittedly he got a lot of help from Thanos. This time, though, I'm actually not relying on Thanos, so there's no way he can screw this up. This time, it's all Yzma. Now, you might be thinking, how am I possibly going to be able to handle Marshall's entire team with weak armor Mandibuzz? Well, Marshall leads with Throw, 
Since Yzma is faster and weak to Rock-type moves, Throw will always use Rock Tomb to try and lower my speed. But every time that he uses Rock Tomb, he activates Weak Armor, which will raise my speed. If I use Iron Defense, I can offset the defense drop from Weak Armor, such that I'm able to raise my defense without worrying about Throw lowering my speed. With Roost, I can also keep myself healthy. Because Throw is actually pretty weak, and I've maxed out Yzma's defense and HP, I can pretty easily stay out of critical hit range. And as long as I keep track of my boosts and drops, I can also get away with setting up nasty plots. Basically, weak armor and iron defense allow me to safely set up with Yzma until Throw runs out of rock tombs. After that, he starts using Storm Throw, which does always crit, but it also gives me the speed boost I need to outspeed all of Marshall's other Pokemon, since he's no longer offsetting the weak armor speed boosts with rock tomb. So from here, I can kill the throw with an Air Slash, which will never miss because Yzma is holding a wide lens. Conkeldur comes out next, but thanks to the Nasty Plot boosts, an Air Slash knocks it out in one shot. Sock is third, and a critical hit from Rock Slide will break through my stat boosts and kill me from this health. So I have to Roost here, which conveniently removes my Flying type so that Rock Slide does next to nothing. Now, from this range, even a critical hit Rock Slide won't kill Yzma. But Sock doesn't even get the chance to try, because Air Slash flinches. So, after Marshall stalls with a full restore, Sock goes down, and last is Mindshow, but thanks to the speed boosts, Yzma can outspeed and one-shot him with a single Air Slash. And that's a deathless Marshall completed. All that's left is Champion Iris. I have my full team left, but there's no chance they're all making it out of this one. This fight's gonna be a brutal one, and it'll require some hard sacrifices. But this has been 8 attempts in the making. It all comes down to this. So, we step into Iris' chambers, and the battle begins. I lead Darla, planning to do a similar sweep as in attempt 3. Hydreigon starts the battle off strong with a critical hit Dragon Pulse as Darla goes for a workup. Fortunately, in this attempt, Darla is a bit stronger thanks to her brave nature, so she doesn't need to hold an expert belt to guarantee the kill on Dredagon. This way, she can hold leftovers, which gives her just enough health to always survive another Dragon Pulse from Hydreigon. So long as it doesn't crit? Okay, phew! We managed to dodge the double crit. And then on the next turn, we take out Iris's Hydreigon with a Drain Punch. Dredagon comes out next, but I made sure to use a few berries to move around Darla's EVs before the Elite Four so that she was guaranteed to outspeed this dumb thing. And Ice Punch takes it out. Then Agron comes out. Again, I really have no idea why. But the big boy falls to a Drain Punch, and Darla is back to full health. Next up, Archaeops. And here's where it all went wrong last time. Darla's gotta go down here so that we can get a clean switch. She's done her job. So now it's time for her to rest. I click work up in case she survives the acrobatics, but she doesn't. And so our ginger queen falls. After that, I bring in Cruella to Will-O-Wisp the Archaeops, but in my preparations for this battle, I just sort of assumed that Cruella would be faster than Archaeops. She's not. <laughs> she gets one shot by an acrobatics instead. Whoops. This isn't necessarily the worst mistake to make. It just means that now I need to avoid a crit from Thanos 8.0. I bring out Thanos 8.0, who starts with a normal gem boosted fake out. I need to get Archaeops to below half health, as that will activate Defeatist, which halves Archaeops' attack and special attack. This will allow Loki to get a nasty plot off and then sweep through the rest of Iris' team. So I need to do some damage to this Archaeops. But if Thanos 8.0 crits, then the Archaeops will die, and I won't be able to set up with Loki. Please, please just do this for me, Thanos. I click Sucker Punch, and. There's no crit. Thank you, Thanos, for finally putting the team first. Now, Thanos, I need you to go down so that Loki can come in safely. So, I just click Growl, which actually means that Thanos does survive in acrobatics. Okay, so now, I click Growl again, and then the Archaeops misses Rock Slide. Okay, great. But seriously, Thanos, it's time. It's time for you to go. So, I click Growl one more time, and he dodges Rock Slide again. I mean, he's not going down without a fight, but one more growl and Archaeops decides to use Acrobatics, which does finally take out Thanos. Rest well, you beautiful purple bastard. From here, I bring in Loki. I've disguised him as Yzma so that the Archaeops will always go for Rock Slide instead of Acrobatics. An Acrobatics crit will kill Loki, but a Rock Slide crit won't. So, I set up a Nasty Plot. Okay, I guess the Archaeops goes for Acrobatics anyways. I have no idea if Gen 5 AI actually recognizes Illusion or not, because there were several times in this playthrough where the AI just went for Toxic when Loki was disguised as a Ponyard. So, I don't know. Either way, the Acrobatics didn't crit, so a Dark Pulse takes out the Archaeops. 
Next up is Iris's terrifying Haxorus, which is holding a Focus Sash for some reason. But I taught Loki Fling. So, Loki flings his held Razor Fang at the Haxorus, which breaks the Sash and causes a flinch. Then, a Dark Pulse is enough to knock out Haxorus. Iris's final Pokémon is Lepron. I can't actually take it down in one shot, so if it crits with the Surf, Loki will go down. But with Maleficent waiting in the back, the battle is won. It's just a matter of whether I need to dig three graves or four. Loki hits a Dark Pulse, and Lepra retaliates with a Surf. But it leaves Loki in the yellow. So, on the next turn, he fires off one last Dark Pulse, knocking out Lepra, and finally winning us the run. That was a lot of fun. I can't say it felt particularly great to lose Crocodile and Drapion so early, but it made for a hell of an endgame, and it was so cool to see all my other team members step up to the plate. Every single one of the final six team members contributed to at least one of the final fights. Even Thanos 8.0 was able to seed bomb his way through Marlin and get Archeops into defeatist range. This was easily one of the funnest challenges to do, and I'm so glad I returned to it. And I hope you liked the video. I'm not a huge fan of making challenges into multiple videos, but in instances like this where there's just so much information, or for Johto challenges where there's a whole other region to explore, I think it makes sense. So let me know in the comments what you think about splitting up challenges into multiple videos, and if I should do more of them. In the meantime, if you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't. I, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. And you should also join the Flygon HG community discord, where you can discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description. Stay tuned for more Nuzlock videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.